Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair, and with news of new MonsterVerse movies just on the horizon, I'd better get around to actually reviewing this one. Having already covered Legendary's Godzilla King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong, there is one glaring, gargantuan, gorilla-shaped hole on that list. The missing link, you ask? Kong Skull Island. Released in 2017, Kong Skull Island came out between Godzilla and Godzilla King of the Monsters. And why hadn't I reviewed it yet? Well, I didn't feel right doing it not having seen any of the previous Kong movies leading up to this one. Of which there were none. This is the start of Kong's story in the MonsterVerse. We get our little origin story for King Kong. In Kong Skull Island, we see that decades ago, people explored the previously uncharted Skull Island and discovered a creature living there that no one could have expected. King Kong. Oh, and an absolute ton of other monsters. So they must fight. Which is a bit of a different take from the original, and just capture him and bring him to New York for a sideshow. But I guess they do mix it up every now and again, like the 1976 version where they explored Skull Island looking for oil because the world was about to run out of it. But nevertheless, let's take a look at Kong Skull Island and see this new take updated for modern audiences. I, I don't mean like that. We open up way back in 1944, during the previous World War. An American pilot winds up on an uncharted island, and the only one to join him is a Japanese pilot. They both open fire, but luckily for us, flyboys don't get much time on the range. So they run into the jungle and fight! More for looks than accuracy, otherwise our freedom-loving fighter would have easily lost his fingers here. But trying to murder each other can wait. Oh crap, not again! Big damn ape out of nowhere? That requires an explanation. Later, first we gotta skip ahead all the way to 1973, where we are introduced to Bill Randa, played by John Goodman. He represents Monarch, and is keen on getting some funding for a little expedition before the war machine completely grinds to a halt, what with the end of the war in Vietnam and all. He and Houston Brooks, played by Corey Hawkins, meet with Senator Willis, played by Richard Jenkins. Now, meet with is a strong word. He's been trying to avoid them, what with Bill constantly asking for money for crackpot schemes to try and discover the unknown. Oh, what's this? An uncharted island that was just picked up with satellite imagery, planes go down and ships vanish, big whoop. However, Brooks interjects that it will only be days before the Russians know of the island as well. So if there is anything worthwhile there, it would behoove them to allow Monarch to discover it first before Russia inevitably will. I don't believe I'm saying this, but that almost made sense. Well, if anything, it makes a hell of a lot more sense than Evil Snake Woman uses a brain control thingamajig to take over King Kong and subjugate Atlantis. So he gets his funding and a military escort. This introduces the military. The young ones are happy to be heading home soon, but Lieutenant Packard, played by Samuel L. Jackson, is wondering about the war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. All this bloodshed just for the United States to say fuck it and leave. He's not happy retiring on that note. So when word comes that there is a military escort heading for an uncharted island, he can't wait to go. But he's not the only one going. They also need a guide. Someone skilled, smart, reliable. More importantly though, handsome, rugged, and just dirty enough to come off like he doesn't care how he looks, but he absolutely does. James Conrad, played by Tom Hiddleston. You came here looking for a tracker. Who or what am I tracking? Be honest with you, man, uh, UBS hasn't updated the tracking on my order in like a week and I'm getting antsy. But they don't know what they're looking for anyway, but whatever it is, they're gonna wanna find it and document it, which is where our photojournalist comes into play, Mason Weaver, represented by Brie Larson. She's thankful for this opportunity, but you know who isn't? The young soldiers. All hyped to go home, only to find out they're being flown out to another jungle at the last minute. Plenty more people are heading out, of course, such as Steve, played by Mark Evan Jackson, and Victor Neves, played by John Ortiz. He gives the rundown on Skull Island. As our satellites show, the island is surrounded by a perpetual storm system, allowing it to remain hidden from the outside world. Because big fucking storms that never move are just so easy to overlook. 
But with the mystical futuristic technology available in 1973, they can finally defeat the storm with helicopters. So the army guys fly in and bring with them the monarch science types, who are going to perform a geological survey of sorts, bomb the shit out of the island, and measure the intricacies of the boom boom to see what the island's made of. Also, the storm will mess up radio communication, because of course it will, but don't you worry. The refuel team will be coming on the north side in three days, but oh darn it, when they arrive to the storm-surrounded island, there's a storm in the way. Victor says that's it, pack it in, they're going home. This is only a map survey. To one of the last uncharted areas on the face of the earth, and you want to call it on account of rain? Rain that they knew damn well was going to be there. I thought being able to deal with it was the entire reason the expedition got the okay. So the storm is tough, but don't worry. Packard is just the man to be able to deal with that little problem. A handy dandy low pressure pocket and his expert leadership is all the team needs to punch through and reach Skull Island. So it's time to get to work. The science types set up a little camp while the helicopters blow the island the fuck up, revealing its secrets. Hey Randy, you're not gonna believe this. The bedrock is practically hollow. The Hollow Earth. It's real. It's where the monsters come from, and it connects to the surface on Skull Island. In the movie, in real life, the Hollow Earth the theory is still just crackpot bullshit. Unfortunately, their happy little blow-the-jungle-the-fuck-up vacation is cut short when they hit a tree, which really shouldn't be that high in the air. That's because it was thrown by the biggest, the baddest, the breathtaking King Kong! Hey, Mason, no one is gonna believe this, but you are a photojournalist, so maybe... Take a photo for journalism. Nope, the only shooting that's going to be going on will be bullets as the army dudes fire away at the creature. But considering they can't penetrate nearly deep enough to reach vital organs, this just pisses them off. So we get an awesome bombastic explosive action scene. Army guys are slaughtered left and right. And the visuals are damn nice. So many huge events just littered with fine details. Pretty much every single miscellaneous grunt bites the big one at this point. But don't worry, all the important faces we got to know earlier somehow managed to survive, though split into separate groups. Conrad's contingent has him taking command, saying that they should head north along the river to reach the rendezvous three days from now. We're really not gonna talk about it. You know, this is not normal, right? Stuff like that doesn't just happen. Sivko, played by Thomas Mann, being the only one among either group to have a realistic reaction to watching an astronomical ape annihilate all his closest friends. Jack Chapman, played by Toby Kettle, also survived, but he's all by his lonesome. Just him, and the big damn pile of weapons his helicopter was carrying. He managed to get in contact with Packard, and his orders are to stay put while Packard's group moves to pick him up. So Packard's got his own group of army guys, including Cole, played by Shea Wiggum, and Mills, played by Jason Mitchell. Not to forget Relis here, played by Eugene Cordero. There'd be more, but yeah, body count rises, you could say. Something that pisses Packard off something fierce, so he confronts Bill about this. Sure, he knows something about what just slaughtered half his men. My agency is known as Monarch. We specialize in the hunt for massive, unidentified terrestrial organisms. You knew that thing was out here? Well, it's always in the last place you look. Seems Bill's shipmates were also killed. He was the only survivor in what is officially filed as a combat encounter, and he spent his life trying to prove that monsters are real. So, they got proof, just... Gotta get out of here and wipe the suckers out. But then they're not all bad. Moving back to the other group, and, uh, ah, yeah, didn't mention her yet, uh, San, played by Tin Jing, is also there to witness an enormous water buffalo rise from the lake right before them. There we go, 40 minutes in, and you finally take a picture of one of the creatures. A water buffalo. Still, still it's, it's really big, and that'll probably come out on film. Except the, the flies buzzing around it are enormous, if you want to go by the scale of this thing. Those, those flies are about the same size as bloat flies in Fallout. They aren't in the market for monster encounters, though. Unlike Packard and company, he intends to avenge his lost soldiers by finding that ape and killing him. But first, they gotta get through this unassuming bamboo forest. Until a bamboo stalk 
kills one of the men because it is not bamboo, but the leg of an enormous spider who attacks. Chopping at its legs, they fight for their lives. <laughs> D.D.F. They know well enough the only good bug is a dead bug and they take it out. While this is going on though, Conrad's group has encountered something even stranger. Ruins. What could have made these? <gasps> oh. oh, humans. Well, I guess that makes sense. But the big surprise comes when the World War II pilot who wound up here in the opening shows up. Hank Marlowe, played by John C. Riley. It seems in the decades he's been on the island, he has befriended the natives, so they are instantly friendly. Boy, that's convenient. There's something out there, man. Oh, there's a lot out there. Good, good. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for your losses or whatever, but if there's one thing I love in my monster movies, it's monsters. As such, it's been almost 10 minutes, it's time for another monster encounter. Chapman is hiding just out of view of Kong when BAM! The ape does battle with a kraken! Tentacles attack from all sides, but that's nothing a little boot to the head can't solve. Then it's a king-sized calamari dinner. Okay, moving on, we're back with Marlo for a wonderful tour of the natives' village. No crime, no personal property. They're past all that. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's great, Marlo, but need I remind you, there's also no cheesesteaks, no Xboxes, and oh yeah, every other day a giant damn monster comes and eats a few family members. At least I can say that some of the commentary on living in a society is a little better thought out. Hey, what happened with the war? Did we win? Which one? Uh, that makes sense. Which makes it kind of frustrating. Uh, the, the Japanese soldier in the movie? Oh, he just died before they got there, so we don't get any kind of scene with a World War II Japanese soldier encountering 1973 Americans and the kinds of interactions they could have. I, I know that's not the focus of the movie, but it's also two hours long. The old boat here, though, is a shrine. Also handed in a historical account for a good old-fashioned exposition dump. Big damn monsters ate people, until a bigger damn monster began kicking the other monsters' asses. However, in the pursuing monster fights, only one big damn friendly monster managed to survive. Their king, Kong. He's the only one left to fight the demons that come up from under the ground. Savage creatures. They killed Gunpei at some point before now. But I call them skull crawlers. Why? Because it sounds neat. Okay. Really? I figured it had something to do with them being on Skull Island with exposed skulls and crawling around. Look, I just made that name up. I'm trying to scare you. I'm fine calling them that. Are you cool with that? Yeah, that, that seems like a good I like the name, like a, a so I think... Guys, guys, if a joke does not land in the first place, you do not stretch it out. That doesn't make it funnier. You never said that name out loud before. It sounds stupid now that I say Just... You call them whatever you want. <laughs> Graboids worked in Tremors because at the time the characters just rolled their eyes and moved on before just seriously using the term Graboid to describe the creature from there on out. Camp doesn't work when you try and make it into comedy. But it seems like when they carpet bomb the island, a whole lot of skull crawlers started crawling around. Fortunately, Kong can kill most of them, no problem. You don't want to wake up the big one. How big is it? It's bigger. Look, scaling in the monster verse is kind of fast and loose, but if we all just agree that it's really big, then job well done, right? So that's the history, but what of the future? Well, Conrad informs Marlowe that a refueling team will be coming to the north end of the island in three days. At which point Marlowe realizes he won't be going home. There's no way they can get to the north end in three days. At least not on foot. Ah, I got it. Whistle for Kong, and he can just pick you up and throw you like a football. Actually, he and Gunpei had a group project going on, trying to make a motorboat to leave. But it was kind of a group project, and once his friend got gobbled up, Milo just didn't feel like doing the two or three steps left to get it running. But with so many hands on deck, they should be able to knock it out in an afternoon! Unless you got a better idea, I suggest we get cracking. I still think the Kong toss would be better. You can use bubble wrap if you want. Heck, they even have a chance to ask as Mason gets face to face with Kong, but moments later. Camera. Picture. Take one! 
Or maybe a picture of any of the other obvious evidence of giant monsters on the island, like ooh, the enormous bloody handprint on the side of a mountain. That could work. The army sees that, though. And our time is better spent talking about poetic ideals. You know why I carry this instead of an M16? Lots of Vietnam soldiers did. The M16, when it was first released, uh, they had a last-minute change of ammunition, and there was this weird rumor going around that it was this crazy future tech that you didn't even have to clean, and that led to a lot higher failure rate than it had to. And just, at the time, first-gen M16 was just not nearly as reliable as an AK-47. But Cole has a story about how it's a Vietnam farmers who surrendered immediately after the Americans burnt their village to the ground. Sometimes an enemy doesn't exist until you go looking for one. I'm pretty sure nobody went into that forest looking for a giant damn spider. But I am looking for something, something that happened. The subscribe button. Subscribe button. I gotta find it. And the like button. Where the hell did they go? I click them if I could find them. They're still on the march, though, trying to rescue Chapman, who could be doing better. Seems the log he was sitting on turned out to actually be an enormous stick bug. A log bug, if you will. But that's not a threat to him. You know what is? The skull crawler eating him alive! Never mind that for now, though. We have to establish something really important. Weaver can't see her camera to set the exposure without her flashlights. Not to worry, Conrad can hand her his lighter. Royal Air Force? My father's. He threw it to me from the train as he rolled off to fight the Nazis. His plane went down near Hamburg. They searched for him for months, but... Neat! Okay, I'm just gonna keep this now. I'm sorry about your, about your dad. That, that has to suck. But with the boat all ready to go, Marlo has to say goodbye to Gunpei. Yeah, the man's still dead, and has been dead so long he's still played by Miyavi, but it's the principle of the thing. They're leaving for home, which means he has to leave the only home he's known for these decades, and his surrogate brother of anecdotes. That's great, take another picture of uh, humans. And we, we've got better pictures of the Loch Ness Monster here. And that's after they've been proven false. So they take to the river, heading north, while Packard and company continue on towards Chapman's last known location. Still checking in with the radio every now and again, though, which is how they manage to contact one another. A rendezvous is set. Everything is going to be okay. <laughs> Ignoring, of course, the flying monster birds that have been circling the sky for God knows how long. They've got Victor! But the guys don't shoot. Don't want to accidentally hit him. Let's just watch him get torn apart in midair. That's so much better. I don't know, that could have gone better, but it ain't gonna slow them down and the groups reunite. Now they got the boat to get the hell out of there, but Packard reveals to Conrad that Chapman is still unaccounted for, so they're not leaving. They're heading west directly into Skullcrawler territory. I've taken enough photos of mass graves to recognize one. That's great, but you know, no reason to stop now. You can always use another picture of a mass grave with massive bones and a lot of evidence to back up the story you're gonna have to tell when this is all over. Nah, she'll just stand around looking pretty amidst the enormous pile of undeniable evidence. Bill at least does have a camera himself and is taking all the pictures. But you know what that means. Oh, shit. Come to think of it, this could be why it's so hard to get evidence for cryptids. It's like one Polaroid snap of Mothman and suddenly he's bum-rushing you and beating the crap out of you. With an action scene underway, they set up a 50 cal machine gun turret on a frickin' Triceratops head. Good, this still counts for Dinosember. And an action scene breaks out. Lorenzo gets fucking annihilated immediately. And the Skullcrawler terrorizes the group. The Flammenwerfer gets verfed. And toxic gas grenades explode. Undeterred super badass hero James Conrad grabs a katana and a gas mask and slashes his way through the monster birds in slow motion. Cool as that looks, Conrad. Uh, you are still absolutely surrounded with toxic gas, so uh, maybe you want to leave the mask on for just a little while longer. But there's still the skull crawler to deal with. Not to worry, Weaver can use that handy dandy letter she nicked earlier to make one of those convenient gas vents ignite, blowing it the fuck up. 
After the dust settles, Conrad's like, hey, bad news. The skull crawlers vomit their digested food in the valley, and as it turned out, Chapman was one of them. The search is over. Doesn't change a thing. We're still going to that crash site. What's at that crash site that you want so badly? Look, there's a trophy for reaching the crash site before the convoy arrives, and I'll be damned if I played through this twice just to get the platinum. Of course, it's the stockpile of weapons, and he intends to kill Kong to avenge his men. Thus, the reunited group has a split. Packard refuses to abandon another war, and the science types swear that Kong is a nice, enormous ape who killed most of his men. Thus, the civilians leave, and Packard orders his men to follow. And Steve, because he's kind of an idiot. In any case, the civvies try and find their way back to the river and the boat. It's a bit confusing, so Conrad and Weaver scout ahead, while the rest keep lookout. Keep your eyes open. Up in the trees, too. Why? Ants. Big ones. Woo, are they enormous? And do they shoot acid out of their butt? And do they come in packs of 2,000? There's one. Sounds like a bird, but it's a fucking ant. And in the mother of all teases, there is no ant scene. Evidently, John was just trying to get everyone to laugh on set, but they figured, hey, giant ants actually kind of make sense on Skull Island, but they never got around to actually making a giant ant scene, so this is all we get. I'm still waiting on Legendary Pictures EDF. It takes them all day, but they finally find the river and their bearings. Also, a great view! So Weaver starts taking all the pictures, until she suddenly stops. Must be because there's something actually worth taking a picture of nearby. Kong! They see his majesty, shortly before seeing that trap that Packard has set for him. So they must rush to save the ape! Everyone else, back to the boat. The heroes must be heroic. It's quite a hike, though, giving us plenty of time for a fiery battle. Kong burns in napalm, flailing wildly, and killing Packard's men left and right, only to collapse knocked out. Place your charges! It's time to show Kong that man is king. And we will prove that by blowing up one of the Earth's only protectors. I can't say it's out of character. But what's this? Conrad and company swoop in to save the day, pleading to him that killing the giant superhero isn't the best strategy. He doesn't care. The world is bigger than this. This please! That ape is fucking huge! But they do manage to convince his men to abandon the cause right before one of those little skull crawlers show up. That's a big one. Oh, big skull crawler. Thanks. It's kind of hard to tell. So they must run, except for Packard. Die, you motherfucker. I'm sure they could bring him back for a sequel. Just say that he was on an incredibly thin piece of land and Kong just slapped him right into the hollow earth in an incredibly comical fashion. But wait! Weaver actually points the camera at the giant monsters fighting each other! And doesn't take a picture. To be fair, there are more important things right this red hot minute, but goddammit! Weaver's gotta go fire a signal flare for the boat, while everyone else deals with the giant monster problem, and the fact that we're gonna whittle down the remaining characters pretty heavily from here on out. With that in mind, Cole decides he's gonna die anyway, so may as well be a hero's death. Sacrifice himself to save the others! Tempting the Skullcrawler to eat him while he's holding live grenades! Hmm. Well, it wasn't exactly as heroic as he was intending, but that was still a pretty fucking cool way to go, Cole. But Kong is the hero of this movie, doing battle with Big Mama Skullcrawler, slapping its skull sideways with a sequoia before he himself becomes tangled in an enormous chain. No bother, just means he's got a handy dandy kaiju sized weapon to use against the beast. So Weaver can smack it with a flare, the boys can tickle it with a machine gun, and Kong can reel that some bitch in with a propeller projectile. Wrestling the beast, he kills a Skullcrawler Queen. Therefore, happy ending! Weaver is saved from drowning. That way, she can take one last picture of Skull Island before they leave. A normal human being. Really going hard with the photojournalism here. And Hank can be reunited with his estranged wife. Their son grew up while he was gone. And yeah, it's definitely his because he's played by Will Britton, the same actor who played Hank Marlowe in the opening. Oh, but don't forget the after credit scene. The heroes were oh so important. They are invited to join Monarch because hey, in case you forgot, there's more giant ass monsters than just Kong out there.
a clear setup for King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong. Which might have been more exciting had I actually watched this movie when it came out. But uh, nevertheless, that was Kong Skull Island. And ooh, it's pretty. While fine acting, memorable characters, and a plot worth telling are all well-known strengths to have in a movie, I feel that oftentimes people don't appreciate the picture part of a motion picture quite as much as it deserves. With the right sense of style and cinematography, it's moving art, where visuals alone can elicit far more emotions than a thousand pages of exposition. That right there has to be the biggest strength of Kong Skull Island, the spectacle of it all. Pretty visual effects abound, and it's one of those movies that has so many small details going on that I'm very happy I got to see it in 4K. Hell, I'd go so far as to say that this would be the movie to test that theory that you can't see any difference between 4K and 8K. I'd venture to say there'd be enough added detail in the tiniest of dust particles that, yeah, you'd notice. And as you can likely guess from me gushing over how pretty the movie is, the rest of it is... Yeah, it's okay. The characters are all memorable and individuals, but no one really steals the show in any way. Conrad's an adequate hero. Packard is an acceptable villain, and Marlowe is a pretty lackluster comic relief. Now, to its credit, the movie doesn't take itself too seriously. It knows what it is and does its best to do a good job at that, and yeah, it worked. The humans are interesting enough, but we're here to see the monsters and watch the monsters fight. To that end, Kong could have used one or two more brawls for the two-hour runtime. His opening fight was amazing, and the final battle certainly worked, but in between, all he really did was get some takeout. The rest of the island's horrors did keep the movie interesting, though, with a variety of terror in all directions. At the end of the day, Kong Skull Island is good old gourmet popcorn. It set out to tell its story of a big damn ape that beats up other big damn monsters amidst explosions and slack-jawed human onlookers. It did just that, and the best damn job of it it could, coming in at four exploding best friends out of five. I mean, the picture's important, and it's certainly fun, but I'm not saying that a jaw-dropping plot that really makes you think isn't an important thing to have. Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, to move to the path of enlightenment, we must go past the ideas of personal property. So, uh, lay off the copyright claims, all right? That is one ugly ass bird. Ah, there they were. It's just right next to the video player this whole time. I was checking in the description. I found the link to buy the movie on Amazon and to support the channel on Patreon, but, uh, oh well. If I'm looking for anything else, like, ooh, I don't know, more MonsterVerse movie reviews, whew, there they are. Check them out. Or, of course, if you would prefer, the algorithmically selected recommended video. YouTube thinks that that's the one you want to see. I don't know if they're right. I don't know what they pick. What do they pick? <laughs>